Hello and welcome to the Foreign Press Podcast. I'm Nia Kofi Smartabe. This podcast is an educational program by the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the USA, AFPC USA. This episode is developed in partnership with the Heinrich Foundation. The AFPC USA is solely responsible for the content of this episode. Steel plays a huge role in our daily lives. It is present in the appliances we use, in construction, and in the building of most things we use like airplanes and cars. But as much as steel is a vital component of our modern industry and the global economy, the industry also contributes significantly to global greenhouse gas emissions. According to a 2021 report by the UK-based climate science website Carbon Brief, the steel industry is responsible for 11% of carbon dioxide emissions. This is mainly due to the methods used to produce steel, which includes combining iron with carbon, recycled steel and other elements. But that is not all. There is a lack of standardization in the industry, which makes it presently difficult to hold the various steel manufacturing countries to one standard. The industry, however, is committed to going green. But with the current lack of uniformity, will it be possible for the industry to agree on a single blueprint for reducing carbon emissions? Dr. Debra Elms is the founder and executive director of the Asian Trade Center and president of the Asia Business Trade Association. She has extensive experience working with governments, international organizations, businesses and academia and is a leading expert on trade policy in the Asia region. She joins us shortly to walk us through the challenges of the steel industry and how feasible its goal of producing low-carbon steel is. Dr. Elms, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. We wanted to talk to you, of course, about this decarbonization of steel um, sector report. And reading through the report, one thing I noticed or the main point that stuck out to me was the fact that there's lack of standardization when it comes to a measuring carbon emissions in the sector. And also that there's even a lack of standardization when it comes to the definitions and thresholds that they use in the steel sector. And I'm wondering, why is that so? Because this is a global industry, you'd think at least they would have one measure for everything. No, you you definitely don't have that. You don't have one measure, I think, for almost anything, whether it's carbon or not carbon, whether it's steel, whether it's Uh, acceptable pesticide levels in wheat and corn, those are all over the map, whether it's electronic standards about, you know, your headphones and whether or not the volume is the same volume. I mean, there are really inconsistent application of standards across the board in all kinds of products. So that's a problem already, an inconsistent use of standards. There are some international standards for some things, but not every country pegs to those standards. Many of them have domestic standards. And particularly here in the region, or at least in Asia, many countries use standards as one of the methods to keep out foreign products. So by having domestic level standards, I ensure that it's harder for foreign competitors to align with my standards, which could be quite different, and crucially to test and be certified as aligning with my standards can be very hard for foreign companies. So we have that problem to begin with. And then when you compound that with something like carbon and embedded carbon in a product like steel, it gets even more complicated because there's no group that does this that's agreed upon by everyone. And for many places, particularly for developing countries, there is, I would say, less consistency or less common discussions, as shows up in the report, about what is the appropriate level of carbon embedded in something and what those thresholds should be is also in high dispute. And it's not just in steel, it's in a lot of things, but particularly as we move into the climate space and into sustainability discussions. For developing countries in particular, this gets to be a very fraught conversation because they say, look, one of our advantages is that we can produce products often more cheaply not necessarily because we are worse for the environment, but simply because we're cheaper. And and if you're going to make us level up to the level of the most advanced industrialized countries, 
that's going to put us at an extra competitive disadvantage. And so it's not just that we disagree on the standard, we disagree on how to measure it. We even disagree on the objectives. And I think all of that shows up uh, in a report like the one that you're discussing, because we just have a, at the moment, no consensus around where the appropriate measurements are, thresholds, and, and how we achieve that consensus is still unclear too. But how, doesn't this affect productivity in the sector in, in a way, if they can agree on one standard measurement for anything they do, or everything rather that they do? It is a real challenge. It's a, it's a particular challenge, again, you can imagine for smaller companies, it's a challenge for companies that don't have the same deep pockets for proving that they meet the standard, for understanding how to even align with the standard. And so the use of standards, which has always been there in global trade, is again, becoming a much more important mechanism for managing trade than it used to be. And as we move again into the climate space, and as we talk more about sustainability in trade and carbon intensity in trade, it will become an even more challenging area because not everyone starts with the same resources, not everyone has the same ability to meet those standards. And again, if you drive costs up in developing economies in order to compete with developed economy standards, that could be very problematic both ways, actually. And so, well, you mentioned trade. How does this impact trade? I mean, the lack of standards and also what benefits would the sector derive once they are able to standardize decarbonization, for instance, in the industry? Well, let me give you a simple example. So the European Union has their Carbon Border Adjustment Measurement, or CBAM, which is just coming into effect now. And that can be very problematic for non-European countries, especially non-European developing countries, who have to understand a very complicated piece of, of legislation, a lot of standards embedded in that, apply that in a context that is very different in their domestic environment, where there may be no rules at all on carbon, at all. <laughs> so they have to sort of catch up with what are European standards, and then they have to be prepared if they're not yet meeting those standards to pay a price for their exports, which is new and can be quite expensive. Uh, and that is going to create real challenges for potential exporters around the world who are suddenly confronted with much higher trade compliance costs and potentially impossible levels of, of complexity that they have to address. So we're going to see, we see this already with the beginning under the CBAM as that becomes potentially more of a norm in some places. Yes. We will have those kinds of differences between markets that again can be seen as appropriate. You can say, yes, for climate reasons, we absolutely need to do this, but for competitiveness reasons can be really challenging. Again, especially it's gonna hit the hardest as always, developing countries and smaller companies who really don't have the resources to comply. The developing countries were mentioned a few times in the report as well. So what is their specific challenge that they won't be able to meet the decarbonization standards or that they don't actually have a problem complying with that? It could be all of the above. I think it depends on, on which company and which country and which product. Okay. Um, it could be that they simply are unable to meet the standard because even if they wanted to, they have no way to prove that they do so. In some cases, they potentially could meet the standard, but again, it's the compliance challenge. In some places, they can't meet the standard because it is, it's relying on a whole lot of inputs that are not available. So we don't always, I, again, this sort of early days in the pricing of carbon specifically uh, and how yeah. that will be applied, but we do see it in other areas. As you start to roll out rules that require especially high levels of knowledge and documentation of component elements in a product, all the way back to the raw materials and then all the way forward on things like environmental issues or labor issues. That can be really difficult for uh, many firms, especially again, developing country firms, to, to meet simply because there is no infrastructure to do that. So even if you said, my product meets the criteria, 
And yeah. I know what meets the criteria in order for me to show you with your oh. version of paperwork, exactly. that can be impossible. It just doesn't exist. Or we don't have, for example, we don't have companies that can certify that the products do meet the standards along the way, or we don't mm. have anyone who can audit the results, for example. I mean, this may develop over time, but at the moment, sometimes these criteria are simply impossible for companies or countries or both to meet. Is it a technology issue that the developing country would say, I meet the standards, but of course, I don't have the technology that you have in, say, the Western parts of the world to say that actually I am meeting the standards that we've all agreed to or the set standards for your market? I think the answer to that is yes. It can be technologically difficult because the especially the production processes and the production methods that I might use might be quite different from production processes and methods that are used certainly in Europe or the United States. And so if you are expecting me sitting in fill in the blank where, especially developing countries again, to be able to demonstrate to your satisfaction that I meet those standards, I can't. We, we, that's not how we produce things. That's, again, that's not how we deal with environmental issues in general. It's not how we deal with labor issues. It's not how we you know, fill in the blank what. It's just, it, it can be impossible for me to, to produce things in a way that I would produce things if I were sitting in, let's say, Germany. Yeah. I mean, it seems sort of obvious to many people when you make that statement. You say, hey, yeah. you know what? Someone in Indonesia cannot produce things as if they were sitting in Germany. They say, well, yeah. But then you say, but the rules actually are written for producers who are sitting in Germany, for example, who have very different environments and very different ways of addressing things. And when you apply those standards to firms who are sitting in Indonesia, I don't think anyone should be surprised. It can be very hard for Indonesian companies to match the same level of, of approach that you get out of a German company sitting in Germany. Now, again, why do we do this? The Germans would say, because those are the appropriate standards. If we want to protect the environment, if we want to make sure workers' rights are protected, if we want to make sure the consumers are, are taken care of, if we want to fill in the blank, what is our objective? That's what we want. And we don't want to lower our standards. We don't want to accept products coming in from Indonesia that are made in a more way that's more polluting potentially or more hazardous or th they would say fine. But the net result of that from a competitiveness and a trade perspective is that the Indonesian firms either will struggle or may not even be able to sell products into Germany if they're expected to look exactly like German firms in Germany. Because mm. one thing I also thought about was, even whilst I was reading the report, I, I assumed, for instance, if I haven't read the report, and I only saw that bit about the inconsistency or the differences in standardization, and I asked myself, so if they have differences in standardizing, then why do they even try to decarbonize the industry in the first place? You know, what benefits do we derive from having a decarbonized steel industry? Well, then you have less carbon that's being produced in the atmosphere. And so again, from the perspective of many, they would say we should all pursue these approaches. We should all be less polluting. We should all be using less carbon and carbon. We should be using less carbon intensive production methods. We should be able to more easily, for example, recycle, reuse, etc. But again, I think not everyone starts from the same starting line. And so how do you get the outcome you want when you aren't starting consistently in the same spot? If you're in the climate space, you argue that in the climate space, I don't care where you start. The point is we all need to end up in the same spot. We need to finish in the same spot. And so mm -hmm. how do I get you to finish in the same spot? Well, one way I do it is that I say, wherever you start is irrelevant as long as you are figuring out how to get to the finish line that's the key and without a clear finish line many would argue there is no incentive for countries like an indonesia firm to change its policies because why if, if it's working for them and if we accept their products then we're not going to get any change either so this is part of the reason why this is such a intractable and challenging set of issues because you are trying to address so many 
constituent parts of the problem. And you're doing so, I would argue, especially in the climate and trade nexus, where we don't really have an organization that focuses on this. So the World Trade Organization focuses on trade, but they don't really do climate. And the UN Climate Convention works on climate, but not on trade. So we don't really have a body that sits around and thinks about the intersection between trade and climate. I think it's important. I think we're going to need to go there because otherwise, where do we have these conversations about what is the appropriate standard? What is the what is the window? Because surely we can't all be at the same level of German firms in Germany tomorrow. So there needs to be some transition period. How long or how short is that? Does it vary by where you start? I mean, there's lots of things that you could do, but we're we don't have a venue really to have those conversations, which is also why this is complicated. Okay, there's this report that I came across about um, steel production in, I think in 2022, last year, that there was a significant reduction compared to the post-pandemic rebound in production. And, and I was wondering what led to the, the drop and what's contributing to its rebound um, post-COVID. I think there's a, a, a number of things, but I would suggest and, and I would have to do more work on this, but I would suggest off the top of my head, it's tied to changes that we've had in the supply chain, some of which predated COVID and some of which are during COVID. And then the adjustment in the post COVID period to whatever we're gonna call as the new normal, as supply chains reshuffle, as we develop this sort of new normal, demand has been quite all over the map for a lot of different kinds of companies. And steel is one of those sectors that has been affected. They were affected under COVID by slowdowns, especially in construction. During COVID, we had very little construction, so you would expect some amount of rebound. But we also have some fiscal challenges, especially around inflation, which creates a harder time achieving greater infrastructure investment, which is where a lot of steel goes. We've had changing demand patterns for other things that are heavy users of steel, like automobiles, where we had z almost no interest in some markets in autos during COVID and in other markets, the interest in buying at your own private automobile went through the roof. So we've had a real shift in automotive sales. That is, again, post COVID, what will that look like? Still unclear. And also in areas like home appliances, you know, which also are another user of steel products, you know, we've had, again, construction, which went crazy in the sort of remodeling, rebuilding space during COVID as people tried to fix up their houses and is moderating now, partly, partly because they've already done it, partly because of inflation. So I think there's a lot of factors that have made this a pretty disruptive sector. And then the last one that I'll just mention, which I think is important, is regula regulatory changes in the steel sector specifically, as governments try to address what was an overcapacity issue, then was less of an overcapacity issue during COVID, but then it's unclear how we're going to have mechanisms in place to address steel capacity on a global level and, and how those will be applied. So looking forward, I know they're working on developing standards for decarbonization in the sector, but if you were to, maybe I'm, I'm forcing you to be uh, someone who predicts the future, I guess, in this position. <laughs> but if you could predict, say, five, ten years from now, do you see the sector having been able to agree on decarbonization standards, definitions and thresholds and all these challenges they're having currently? Do you see it resolved in about, say, even five years time? And the sector being able to contribute actually to um, lowering emissions in, in, on our planet. I think that this conversation is going to continue. I think mm. you will have growing acceptance that there needs to be decarbonization and that decarbonization requires consistency in order to be um, effective. You will have growing acceptance that that decarbonization has to happen sooner than some had imagined or had wanted. Um, and so I can imagine that among some of the steel producers and steel primary steel consumers, that you could get some alignment, maybe even within five years, 
But I think that if you look for a global agreement, I mean, I think a global agreement is going to be longer than five years. But, you know, we, when we have climate disruptions like we're having right now, which are becoming quite clear to lots of places that had not imagined themselves at the forefront of climate crisis, the urgency goes up. And when the urgency goes up, you find a way often to solve many of these issues. So it could be that five years we start to get some much greater consistency and we would not have this kind of conversation five years from now. And I would like to think that 10 years from now, we will not have this conversation because we will have already agreed on many of the key issues that need to be addressed. And in fact, you're already down the path of addressing them rather than having a discussion about whether or not it's a problem. Mm. And for you, what what would it take to get resolution as soon as possible uh, to get these standards implemented? Well, I think one one advantage of the steel sector specifically is that it is more concentrated than some. So you have mm. fewer producers, especially on a global level. You have fewer producers and that's easier because you don't need to get, you know, 200 plus countries to all agree on something. You just need to get the primary producers of steel and the primary consumers of steel to agree on certain baseline. Now that doesn't mean you'll get every steel producer. There will still be some that do not meet the standards, but you would be able to get closer to meaningful outcomes in steel than you might in lots of other sectors we could imagine. So I think that's the good news. And there is the beginning of, of, of mechanisms in place already for steel specifically, because again, we had this overcapacity issue. So we've already got a, a bit of an infrastructure for where we would have those conversations. But what's missing, as I mentioned earlier, is that trade and climate nexus. Who's going to deal with those questions? And I think that is actually becoming an increasingly urgent issue. I think what I'd like to say we would have some kind of nascent, at least agreement on who might do this. But I have a feeling we're going to be fighting about that for quite some time and we'll end up with a piecemeal approach. So this group of countries will deal with it in steel and that group of countries will deal with decarbonization in mm. you know aviation and this mm -hmm. group of countries will deal with it in shipping and so we mm. will end up with this sort of piecemeal approach maybe the result is fine but it would be nice if there was a global group that did at least coordinate it some of yeah. this activity so that we could have rather than fragmented standards and fragmented thresholds we could have consistency Mm. And finally, when it comes to the developing countries, what would it take to get them at par with the rest of the global in steel industry when it comes to decarbonization and standardizing? I think it's a challenge. I mean, I think this, this in general, decarbonization and the developing world is going to be a challenge. In steel, it may be less of an issue because you may have discover, because you, again, because it's a, a concentrated sector, fewer developing country participants in that space than there are in almost anything else. But those who are in the space, most likely do not all meet the criteria that might be imagined. And so then what do we need to do? Do we need to increase investment into those particular areas or those particular plants or processes, et cetera? Do we need to have additional assistance? It could be aid money. It could be some kind of you know infrastructure investment fund that supports the development of more carbon friendly steel production. But I suspect it will be a combination of carrots and sticks. So you'll have to give some kind of assistance, of, uh, I can imagine, but also potentially, and this is, we, unfortunately we go down this path a lot too, of sort of punishment. If you don't meet these criteria, you can't sell in our market or you can't sell at this price or you, know, you, you just don't fit the criteria at all. So I think it'll be a combination of those things, but it will be challenging for developing countries to meet standards if we're not care. This is why we need more thought about this. If we're not careful about how these are set and we're not careful about the timeline to meet those criteria, the challenge for developing countries is going to be significant. Hmm. Dr. Elms, thank you so much for your time with us on the podcast today. Sure. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. That's it for this episode of the Foreign Press Podcast, developed in partnership with the Heinrich Foundation. Visit our website, www.foreignpresscorrespondence.org, for more educational resources produced by the AFPC USA. And check out our dedicated press freedom platform. The address is www.pressfreedom.org for updates on global press freedom violations.
You can always follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We are at Foreign Press USA. And if you haven't subscribed to this podcast yet, make sure to hit the follow or subscribe button wherever you are listening. I hope you join us again next time for another episode of the Foreign Press Podcast. I'm Nia Krofi Smatabe. Thank you.